This survey is uh, largely based on work of a colleague, Neville Berry, who uh, I'm grateful to work with as an occupational health physician. As psychiatrists, I often have to sort of collaborate with my colleagues, and Neville and I work in the chronic pain service. And I have to say that um, if you swim in chronic pain and despair, you really do learn what burnout and stress can be, uh, if not for you as the clinician, the patients who come through the door. Um, and that's probably part of the reason why I'm reluctant to, to actually do this talk, <laughs> but here I am, I'm doing it. In addition, uh, I'd note that um, everything is all, when we do our professional work, it's always wrapped up in not just the professional job, but your personal commitments. And so at the moment, I'm looking after my mother, who's recovering from a total hip replacement, and I've had to sort of like co-op this time to come here. And I think we often don't, we don't account for what our personal demands are as well as our professional ones. So what I'm planning to do is I'm going to give you sort of a, the sort of super view of uh, stress, job satisfaction and burnout. I'm also going to uh, proceed to tell you about a little survey that Neville uh, led back in um, 2005, which makes it quite old. And so when I was being encouraged to present this thing, I had to go into, well, is there more recent research about stress and burnout in colleagues? And there's a couple of studies which I came, came up with from um, Australia and uh, the UK, which we can sort of finally finish well, where, where to from here. So those of you who are interested in burnout, I mean, Maslark seems to be the place to start. Uh, and it's probably most commonly sort of attributed to anybody who works with people uh, or emotion. Um, if you take it as a sense of sometimes, and I must, I must confess, I'm sort of may culpa, as a psychiatrist, I can feel this. Um, Sometimes when the work is particularly tough uh, or you've got a particular uh, array of patients, there's a sense that one almost dislocates oneself from the pain that you're receiving from the patients, your consumers, uh, who are telling you about this stuff, that can feel that you have to step back from it. And that can cor become corrosive in your day-to-day -day work, uh, which is quite you know, well described in the literature. Conversely, when um, ASMS were talking to me about the actual presentation, I noticed that the word they used was job satisfaction, which is a much more bubbly and cheerful thing than, <laughs> than burnout. Uh, and that's the flip side of the coin, is that if you're really satisfied with your job, it's quite clear that there might be a better thing that, that might prevent burnout. Um, but of course, there's a paradox, because I think as medical professionals, we actually, uh, part of our professional raison d'etre, sometimes is intermixed between both the job being satisfied, but also when we aren't satisfied with it, it becomes a much more intense process of sort of a vortex you can get sucked into. This um, Dilbert cartoon, I can't see whether you can read it, um, but basically Catbird, the evil HR director, says, um, the, the worker says, I'm not enjoying my job, and Catbird says, take this powerful antidepressant uh, drug for the rest of your life, and the worker says, I didn't know that um, he could prescribe um, drugs. <laughs> I can hardly see. Um, <laughs> Catberg says, I'd hate to live in a world where that was illegal. Uh, and she's trying to unscrew the, um, uh, it's a boss-proof cap. So uh, this is a simple um, diagram which sort of like captures sometimes the sense of what it is, you're an individual but you work in an organisation. Some of what we're talking about is you can have an individual perspective, and I've, I've had certain colleagues, you know, whether they've been um, cardiothoracic surgeons or uh, general physicians, when you get caught into the organisation, sometimes your perceived individual role seems to not fit with the organisational thing, and that conflict can undermine how you feel. Um, but it is, it's an interwoven sense, and I think this diagram says it quite well. Uh, part of what uh, wasn't said is that, apart from supporting the ASMS, I also tried to see what the um, Ministry of Health was like. So for two and three quarter years, I put myself into the Ministry of Health, working in the dark side. Um, and amongst that, uh, 
I noted that there's plenty of literature from the Department of Labor about stress, and uh, this complicated diagram, which was nicely tidied up for me by ASMS, previously I had the arrows everywhere, I just couldn't put them on the slide, but they tidied up the slide for me. <laughs> but, but broadly, um, there are, if, if you actually break it down, there are just so many component parts to our work that can impact upon where we feel our stress. Um, and that, of course, when, uh, as a psychiatrist or talking with a colleague, just colleague to colleague, and you're asking your colleague about the stress that they're under, it really is at times hard to disentangle that diagram about what is the key stress that's actually proving the, the Achilles heel for that person. The Labor Department, of course, had a, had a version for when you're dealing with this. Is it's a common thing. Often in psychiatry, we use the term the beaker overflows, but also it can be a bucket of energy that, you know, what's, what, what fills your bucket that gives you the energy to do the work that you do? Um, and I have to confess that sometimes, certainly in my day-to-day -day work, if I'm doing uh, multiple things, it's not just the job. It is, it is things like if you're looking after your unwell mother, you've got school kids who are doing NCA exams, you've got a wife who's working double time in her job, and you're trying to do all of this as well as your profession, it's no surprise that the energy can just fall out the bottom, which is sort of like that sense of draining the bucket. Um, there's no real point in reading every uh, little element, but it's the tiny little things that can tip the balance. For me, uh, four to five years ago, it was my father developing dementia. That was actually a critical thing for me in my day-to-day -day work because part of the reason I was a doctor was my father. And so seeing him dement and then keeping working at the same time was quite an intense sense of being drained and feeling, you know, what was that impact on me and my career with carrying on with this? Having said all of that, I think it's really important philosophically and, and actually existentially to say that to actually abolish all stress is ridiculous. And I really do agree with uh, Nietzsche's um, sort of concept that actually it's difficulties which make us who we are. And sometimes in terms of my profession, to actually understand uh, one's colleague or one's patient about the stress or burnout that they're having, if you don't know what that is, you really can't help them. Um, so I'd be the last one to say that you, shouldn't, you should not receive any stress or feel any sense of burn, but you do need to know to recognise it. Oh, God, I can't. This is <laughs> behind me. OK, so uh, this is a, a new colleague who says, can I ask you a question? Sure, new guy. How long do I need to work here before the dark cloud of hopelessness and despair begins <laughs> to lift? I keep expecting the feeling to go away any minute. I, I was hoping to achieve job satisfaction within a month. Once that happens, I figure that total self-actualization can't be far behind. Uh, Dilbert says, I'd give it another day or two. And uh, the colleague goes away and sort of saying, any minute now. <laughs> so. This, this little survey was done in a uh, SMO gathering. Uh, in Capital Coast Health, we have an SMO gathering, which is, uh, in, we're encouraged to go. But I must say that in terms of our proportion of SMOs, typically it's probably less than 25% of our entire SMO population gets there. So a survey was handed out. Uh, the explanation was um, that you know, we were just looking for demographic detail, a short burnout score for Maslark, job satisfaction, which was a 15 question, seven point scale, and GHQ, just looking for psychological distress. 65 questions were handed out. The demographics of those that filled it, no real surprises. Um, majority were physicians closely followed by psychiatrists, um, yay. Uh, note, uh, 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 it's unusual to see such a low percentage of females. I said if we would run that today, I think we'd see quite a switch to more females being present. Um, not many unmarried, um, not many non-European. What's interesting at the time was that the married versus the unmarried were slightly unhappier with the pay rates. And I think, casting my mind back to <laughs> 2005, at that time, the regional hospital was being built and there was lots of de de you know, deconstruction. Our salary rates were sort of static. And I don't know about you, but if you're married and you've got a mortgage and your salary isn't going anywhere and you're working in public, you can sort of feel like there's a sort of a ceiling effect. But that's uh, sort of an aside. It's a plot diagram. Um, it sort of speaks for itself. Um, as you can see, 
On the bottom axis is public tense, on the y axis is the burnout score. And what's interesting is it doesn't really matter what number of tenths you are, it's almost a horizontal line, but that there are quite significant uh, subset of people who actually score quite high on burnout. And I have to say, in all the studies I've read of burnout, there's always a percentage of burnout in every organisation you work. And usually it's around 10 or 15%, uh, which is no surprise for our findings either. Um, of the 65 who filled it out, three were in the sort of serious burnout score. Um, having said that, uh, almost 30% were in the safe or low zone, so quite a lot of people quite reasonably, reasonably happy. Job satisfaction. Um, so if a midpoint is 60 or 4, um, you'll see that most studies will sort of say, and we, we were comparing ourselves, there'd been a study that had been done in Waikato, which um, had, done, had a similar uh, design, and we found that we weren't too dissimilar from Waikato. Um, what was interesting was that uh, there's always a subgroup of people who are really, really dissatisfied. And what's interesting is that, of course, you'd almost expect the more dissatisfied you are, of course, the more psychological distress you'll have. Um, and that's no surprise there either. Um, the x-axis is the years qualified, and the y-axis is GHQ, GHQ being a measure of psychological distress. What's interesting here is, which, which isn't consistent with the international literature that I've explored, is that most studies say that the younger you are and when you're doing part-time studies or just completing your um, fellowship exams, that's the high stress area. And often the diagram should actually be tilted the other way. But remember that this population of 65 physicians, so surgeons, psychiatrists were qualified. So it's an, you, you're actually not comparing the same group. Um, I think if we'd had... Um, registrars, um, medical officers, special scale, we would have found a more consistent thing that the younger you are and the more studies you've got alongside, that's, that's a stress time for our people in our career. So of the GHQ, once again, um, for Wellington, we had 18% uh, scored over 15 and uh, there was just one person who was over 20 whereas the Waikato study was 12 and 2%. Once again, it's not, it's not too dissimilar. This is job satisfaction versus GHQ, just with job satisfaction on the x-axis and GHQ on the y. And once again, you can see just what you'd expect, which is the more dissatisfied you are, the worse your GHQ. So I looked at... Um, the New South Wales Beyond Blue uh, questionnaire that they sent out to 43,000, over 43,000 New South Wales um, SMOs. As with a lot of this literature, very poor response rate, probably not too similar from the attendance record for our Capital Coast Health SMO meeting, um, but the final response rate being 27%, which really tells you that we really don't know, because in my view, the power of that study means that if most of the people didn't respond, you really haven't captured your population. So take that in mind. Uh, what is interesting was that um, quite a high proportion of people would say that they had depression, at least 21% in a lifetime, and 6% at the time of filling out the question. Um, also, that doesn't really surprise me. And the more I look about the literature about burnout and depression, the reason why it's such a murky literature is that if you really drill down to um, the ICD-10 or ICD-11, it's called neurasthenia of the workplace, it really merges with depression. So if you do get burnout, the default principle should be, am I depressed? Um, and so <laughs> that's what I'd be thinking about in terms of therapy, you know, either uh, psychology or medication per se. Um, What's also disturbing is the high level of suicidal thoughts. And I find that, as a colleague, very upsetting to think that, you know, 10.4% in the last 12 months of those people who replied to that New South Wales service actually had thought of suicide, which is stunning for me. Um, this is more consistent, is that the younger and more female, the younger and female uh, colleagues were more prone to feel 
or report the emotional distress of working as a, as a doctor. Oh, burnout, sorry. So, oops. This, um, I came across this as a, a quite a distorted sample, but um, it was a reasonably large size, and that was the BMA annual representative meeting of 2013. Once again, a questionnaire. Once again, even worse response rate, um, so 17.2% which may, it really surprised me because I would have thought, like if we did a survey amongst us in this room, probably I, I'd, ex, I'd expect most of us to just fill it out in between sessions, uh, just, but they didn't uh, respond very well. But those that did, uh, and this is also not surprising, is that people who go to a BMA um, type representative meeting, you'd expect them, a larger proportion of them, to want to make improvements, to be unsatisfied with what, you know, the the uh, work was like, because that's why you'd be representing you know, your colleagues at a meeting like this. Um, but what was interesting was that, once again, the people who are presenting the findings, and this is important, and I think you know, if, if we were saying this locally, I would ask that we not, oops, not necessarily say that this is for uh, us as the ASMS, but we should say this as colleagues, whether you are an ASMS or not, what does your work practice really mean to you in terms of satisfaction and burnout? Um, the, reason, the reason for this is having um, been drawn into re-explore my colleague's 2005 survey, is I said, well, what does it mean? And certainly in the, in the local meeting that um, uh, we talked to, the, there was a feeling in the room that we should repeat the study, um, you know, uh, find out, well, what is it like now? We've got a local regional hospital has been remade. We've had lots of changes. Are we feeling better now than we did then? And the problem that I said from a, well, I feel from both the sort of a scientific and collegial point of view is that these sort of surveys are just like taking a photo in time. There's no real scientific uh, proof of you know, connection between those two photos of what the difference is, especially if you get what I'd expect is a low response rate. Um, to encourage Capital Coast Health physicians to attend a meeting to do a survey of a power enough to say this is a true reflection of us as individuals and organisation would be, in my view, needing over 50, 75 per cent of the workforce. And I, at the moment, just can't see us making time to do that. Many of us work part-time. I'm coming here in my private time, not public time. Um, and those of us who do that, you really notice, you know, well, how's this, oops, how's this going to impact on the organisation? But Neville Berry said it right back in 2005, and I repeat it, repeated it here in 2014. Really, the critical thing about filling out these sort of forms is not really the group, it's you as an individual. Like, if I was to sort of, like, fill out the form right now, I'd say I'd probably be in the mid-range of burnout. I don't think I'm, you know, in the severe end, but I do think I, I'm, I'm there and thereabouts. And I've had to make conscious decisions about my lifestyle, my life balance, and the reasons, both individually and organisationally, why I feel that. And for me personally, it's been a process of it only takes a manager or two or a frustration with um, you know, electronic health record or whatever you're trying to, to do to actually feel disempowered as a clinician. And if you feel you don't have a link with your ASMS, your JCC, or you know, to negotiate your profession, it's very easy to become cynical, disengaged, and step back. And I've certainly felt that. Um, and so ultimately, I feel that these sort of surveys are not really useful from a group point of view, but I think, whoops, I think they're useful for an, as an individual. Um, and for me, it's been a process of actually exploration of my own clinical um, supervision and support. Um, it's a template for me to look at the, what are the work-related issues that are actually impacting upon my work and sometimes my colleagues. So I'm um, helpful to colleagues who are in other departments who come to me stressed it's quite a useful thing to disentangle, well, what, what is the problem, you or the organisation? How much of support do you have? And is there a process where the organisation can come in and actually have EAP or support you in making the situation better? Um, and it's the old things that we talked about, which in terms of occupational health and EAP, which is certainly where Neville Berry was coming from back in 2005. 
Um, but basically, at this moment, I'm not sure, um, and I'm happy for the audience to sort of say what you know you guys feel in your own your own sense of where you're working about whether these sort of things are a worthwhile thing to explore. And I think that was the intent when ASMS asked me to give this talk. Is really it's a, it's a question, uh, both for you as individuals and in your respective areas that you work, whether you want to look at job satisfaction and burnout and see whether it's an individual thing or a group thing that you have to work with. So thank you.